Thank you, Pastor Silver, for that. That is not only a beautiful gospel song, but that's very applicable, very appropriate for what we're going to talk about uh, this morning. I've got a message for you with a, a bit of an um, unusual title. Um, the title is The Scary Parts of the Dish. The Scary Parts of the Dish. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are faithful through the uh, thick and the thin, through the, the light and through the night, the mountaintop and the valley below. We ask you, dear Heavenly Father, and pray very, very sincerely in Jesus' name, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would get a hold of our hearts today. And help us to draw nigh to God. So please bless. Undertake for those watching over the internet now. In Jesus name we ask. Amen. <clears throat> a few years ago we bought a, a little dog named Charlie. And Charlie's a really nice little dog. I have a picture. I brought a picture of him. Show you a picture of Charlie. There's Charlie. And he's a nice little guy. But Charlie has a rare psychological condition. Charlie has piatoskilophobia. <coughs> now when we first brought Charlie home, almost five years ago, we began to notice some rather strange behavior at breakfast time. And we soon learned that our dog Charlie had this piatoskilophobia. Okay, you can put that picture away. Thank you. Now, for those here today who have uh, no idea what piatoskilophobia is, piatoskilophobia means fear of a dog dish. The fear of a dog dish. Now, it's embarrassing for my wife and I to say that our dog is afraid of his own dog dish. And so, uh, I went to work and I invented the term piatoskilophobia. And I took it from the Greek piato, which means dish, and skilo, which means dog, and phobia, which you already know what phobia means, piato skilophobia. And so it just seems that we get more sympathy when we say that our dog has piato skilophobia. And then we hope that people are too shy to ask what that means. <laughs> now you know. But I suppose it may be more accurate to say that Charlie really only has partial piatoskilophobia, because uh, Charlie will eat up the dog kibble in the center of his dish, but the kibble that's around the edges of his dish, he's pretty leery of, and he won't go near. You see, for Charlie, these are the scary parts of the dish. Now, Charlie needs us to stand right beside him, Sometimes I'll stand over top of him, put one foot on either side of him, and sort of squeeze him in a little bit so he can feel I'm there. Sometimes I'll, I'll crouch right down on my hands and knees with him. Get right down there. And then he's not afraid to eat the kibble around the, the walls or the sides of the dish. But I've, I've learned that Charlie is not alone, apparently. Uh, with a simple internet search, I've learned that there are thousands of dogs out there that also have piatoskilophobia. Kind of a cool sounding word, don't you think? I came up with it yesterday. Um, there's a lot of dogs that have this thing. So you may be wondering, how does this apply to our story of Deborah and Barak in Judges chapter 4? Well, I'd like to say that I find that in life, many people actually have their own form of piatoskilophobia. Now, they may not eat out of a dish, per se, but we'll just kind of you know, use that as a backdrop. But there's a lot of people that have their own type of piatoskilophobia. Now, here we've got the story of Deborah and Barak, Judges chapter 4. I'm very proud of many of you for getting through some of those tough words and names there. Uh, in those first eight verses, but you get the idea of the story. Israel had fallen into sin. They turned their back on God, and um, God sort of got their attention by, as it were, selling them into the hand of 
uh, Jabin and his right-hand man, Sisera. And these guys were scary. They were monsters. They had no uh, compassion, no pity, no mercy, and they had powerful, overwhelming armies. They had some 900 chariots of iron, and these things would have been huge and required several horses to pull each one. And so the, they would make the ground shake, and the dust of, of the horses' hooves and so on, and their warriors, their soldiers, were trained to shoot first and ask questions later. Sisera was a real hot shot and uh, probably um, thought that he was invincible. Well, um, in fact, the name Sisera means battle array. Imagine a mom and dad naming their son battle array. I wonder what they had in mind for this kid. Whatever it was, he grew up on the wild side of life, I think, because he was a monster. And Jabin, who was equally a monster, but he was the king, he loved this guy, Sisera, made him uh, captain of all his hosts and so on. And um, uh, now uh, the children of Israel were crying out to God because uh, Jabin and Sisera were oppressing them horribly. And the children of Israel were crying to God, saying, please, please help us. And then God answered prayer. And then through the prophetess Deborah, the word is given to Barak to gather up the army and to go against them. And Barak had piatoskelophobia. You see, for much of the service of the Lord, Barak didn't have a problem. But when it came fighting Jabin and his monster Sisera, all of a sudden, Barak had piatoskelophobia. You see, this was the part, the scary part of his dish. And God was calling upon him to go to battle against Jabin and Sisera. And everyone was terrified of this monstrous army. So for Barak, the hero of the story, he was somewhat paralyzed with piatoskelophobia. And Deborah said, get an army and go. And then he said these famous words to her in verse 8. If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. So he said to the prophetess, well, I'm pretty scared. Uh, oh, I'm not scared. I just have piatoskelophobia. And uh, he said, I'll go if you go with me. And then he said, but if you, if you won't go with me, then I won't go. Now, if that isn't piatoskelophobia, I, I don't know what is. And so how did the story turn out? Well, he went to battle. Was it worth it? Well, you have to understand that he who promised never to forsake us and never to leave us was there in the battle and stood by Barak's side all through the scary parts and the battle. How did, how did it turn out? Did they win? Did they lose? Was it worth it? Well, look at the end here of the chapter. Look at verse 23. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So Jabin and Sisera and all of the mean, nasty Canaanites were more than too much for Israel. They were scared as could be, and Barak was no different. And he was afraid because this was the scary part of the dish for Barak. Now, there's a good chunk of the story here on how Sisera escapes because the battle's going against him. He escapes and runs into a, a lady's tent and she sort of covers him up. He falls asleep. She knows who he is and she takes a, a big nail like they would use um, on their tents with the ropes to hold the tent up. Takes one of these great big nails and a hammer and she came softly and drove it right through his temples fastened him to the ground, which proves he was sleeping on his side, not on his back. Otherwise, I don't know, maybe he'd have a sore throat. <laughs> Forget I said that. Um, what I'm saying here is that we got a story in front of us that clearly illustrates a man that had the scary part of his dish. And he needed the Lord's help. And the Lord didn't fail him. 
If you were to turn a page, you'd find chapter 6, the story of Gideon. The children of Israel again turned their back on God, and God sold them into the hands of the Midianites. Again, some real nasties and horrible people that oppressed the children of Israel for a long time till they started crying out to God. Did you know that it's only when you start crying out to God, that's when God will come to your rescue? You know why we suffer so much? Because we're not crying out to God enough. We're, we're thinking, oh, I can get through this. We're thinking, oh, it's not time to cry out to God yet. When all along we could be enjoying more victory if we would just learn to cry out to God right away. Oh, but that might make me look a little bit, I don't know, weak or maybe like a sissy. No, the truth of the matter is we are broken and undone to begin with. And God is our only source of strength and refuge. And we need to run to him at the first sign of trouble. The Israelites finally cried out to God, and so God raised up Gideon. Gideon was not a man of great power and strength, and he was not a fearless leader. He was a man that had piatoskilophobia. Did you know that most all of God's people seem to have some kind of piatoskilophobia? Did you know that? And Gideon was a man of God. And God was calling him to, to fight the Midianites. And if you'll remember the story, he had an army. He gathered an army of over 30,000. God says, you have too many. Do you remember this? You need to get rid of some. And so Gideon must have really started feeling the scary parts of the dish at that point because he lost 20,000 and he's down to 10. And God told him, you still have too many. And then Gideon must have thought, did I hear God right? And God got rid of 9,000 700. So Gideon's left with 300. And that's the story of Gideon and his 300 against over 100,000 of the enemy. Well, you know, this, this is almost too crazy. I mean, this sort of thing doesn't happen. But when God gets involved, it can work. And so, long story short, is that Gideon had his scary parts of the dish and had to face it, and God was with him. But was it worth it? Was the battle worth it? Yes, the battle was worth it. They were able to rout the Midianites. They made all this noise. They crashed their, uh, their, their clay pots and they uncovered their lights and blew trumpets. And God did the rest. And the Midianites thought that uh, something, something bad was coming upon them and they ended up killing each other. And uh, there was a great victory that day uh, for, for God, for the people of Israel, and for Gideon. Gideon with his piatoskilophobia. I'll tell you another story, even, even before all of this, is after Moses died. Who was the man who took over from Moses? Joshua. Joshua was a man of fears because several times before Moses died, Moses was encouraging him not to be afraid. After he died, in chapter 1 of Joshua, you'll find God picks up where Moses left off and is telling Joshua, fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Why? Because Joshua had piatoskilophobia. And there were parts of the dish he had no problem with. But there were scary parts of the dish. Under Joshua, they had to now cross over the Jordan when it had swelled its banks. They had to go into hostile territory and there were millions of, of the, uh, the Canaanites over there. And they had to take over the promised land. He had never done that before in his life. Isn't it true that usually the things you've never done before and the things that you're doing for the first time, those are the scary parts of the dish. Boy, that's true. Oftentimes, young people, when they get married, you know, they're excited, but they're scared. Uh, even though some young people have practiced driving, when they go for their driving test, some of them are shaking so badly that they have to cancel the test. And they have to rebook. You see, just driving with mom or dad in the car, they can handle that. But when you go for that test and that examiner sits in that car with you, all of a sudden your piatoskilophobia sort of comes to life and now you find yourself with the scary parts of the dish. Because on the other side of the dish is sitting the driver examiner. <laughs> That's pretty scary. Well, Joshua had piatoskilophobia, 
But he who promised never to forsake us nor to leave us stood by Joshua's side all through the scary parts of the dish. And there was quite a number of battles that ensued over the following 20 years. But was it worth it all? And the answer is a resounding yes, it was worth it. Because that's how Israel got into the promised land. If you remember, our Lord Jesus chose him some disciples. How many did he choose? Right? How many? Twelve. Right. He got these twelve and one of them, the, he ended up killing himself. What was his name? Genesis. Judas. Right. Judas. I thought I heard someone say Genesis. <laughs> Judas. Judas. And so then there's how many left? Eleven. Eleven. Right. And so then Jesus dies. He, he's dead. They took his dead, lifeless body and they put it in the cold tomb and rolled the rock in front of it. And then um, the Jewish leaders put some guards there to make sure he didn't uh, escape, or, or I should say that the disciples didn't go in and get the body and make off with the body and then tell everyone he's risen from the dead. That's why they put the guards there. And so there's the 11 disciples. And the 11 disciples were forlorn. They felt crushed and defeated. Their Messiah, their Savior, their King was dead. And it's like the sheep were scattered. The Bible says that God was going to have to smite the shepherd and the sheep would scatter. And that's what happened to these poor fellows. And their whole world just like came to an end. And Peter even said to a few of the other disciples, well, I go a-fishing. He was going to go back to the trade of fishing. But Jesus hadn't called them to go back to their old lives of fishing and farming and things like tax collecting and things like that. He had called them to serve him and to go into all of the world with the gospel. But here they were afraid. Here they had come upon the scary parts of the dish. But he whose promise never to leave us nor forsake us, all of a sudden appeared. And they got strengthened. And sure enough, they carried forth the gospel message. <clears throat> and the church was born. And out of that came uh, Christians who went and started other churches, one of them being in Antioch, north of Jerusalem. And that's where the Apostle Paul was sent out of. And he took the gospel message all over the then known world. Incredible. What a battle. What a victory. Was it really worth it? Oh, we're here today because of it, folks. Because of those faithful disciples and believers, we're here. That's, that's how it happens, is that people share the gospel with people. Angels do not share the gospel. People share the gospel. That's God's plan. And if you're here today and someone shared with you the gospel, and you're born again, saved on your way to heaven, praise God for it. It can be traced all the way back to those 11 disciples with piatoskelophobia. Incredible, isn't it? Fear is something that is common and normal and natural to every human. But as Christians, God asks us to do extraordinary things. And sometimes these things involve the scary parts of the dish. Telling others about Jesus can be a very scary thing. And you think beforehand, well, I'm going to tell my neighbor about Jesus. But when you get up there and you look him in the eyeball, all of a sudden your mind goes blank, your, your mouth goes dry, your, your hands start to sweat. And you say, I just wanted to say hi. And fear. Good old piatoskelophobia. The scary parts of the dish. How many have tried to witness to someone or invite someone to church or give a gospel tract and you experienced fear while doing it? You raise your hand. Look at all the hands. Look around you. Keep your hands up, would you? Look around. Look at the hands. There's a lot of hands. Wow. You know what? Both of mine. Both of mine. I am certainly not some kind of fearless pillar of steel or stone or something. And I have got my own piata skila phobia. But... Anything worthwhile for God is going to involve some scary parts to it. Anything. Something, sometimes it can even be simple tithing. Or last Sunday when we gave sacrifice to God. 
And for a month or so, we've been asking you to pray and challenging you to, to give a sacrificial gift like, like far and beyond what you normally do. Beyond your tithe, beyond your, your gifts for missions, to give a, a sacrificial gift of a week's pay to God. And then let God come to your side and strengthen and bless you because of it. And for some, we've never done that before. And it was scary. For some of us, we've done it for many years in a row. And it's not scary anymore. But for some, it's scary. Everyone seems to have their scary parts. The ministry of our Bible college, Pacific West Baptist College, is a wonderful ministry. It's our baby, folks. We gave birth to that Bible college, and for just about six years now, we've had the joy of training the next generation of missionaries, pastors, and Christian workers to teach the Word of God and to hold to the old paths and to sing the, the old hymns and so on and not to go the way of the world and how so many churches have. Remember that one of the big problems of Israel was that they never passed down to the next generation the things of God like they were supposed to. And praise the Lord for our Bible college because we're actually able to do that. And over a period of years, we can produce men and women with a high, high quality of training. They'll learn a lot that they'll take with them for the rest of their lives. Praise the Lord. But our Bible college now has come to the scary parts of the dish. Right now... We're facing a giant task to become a degree-granting, designated learning institute according to government standards. And folks, it requires faith. We need to achieve a certified degree-granting status and be able to take in Christian foreign students so that they can get jobs in this country and work and pay their way through Bible college. Why? so they can serve the Lord. Why? So they can win souls and establish churches and strengthen Christians. Why? To the glory of God. That's why. That's why we're doing it. And for us, the scary parts of the dish involve a lot of work now. Stacks of paperwork. Drafting, listen to this, drafting up a private act for the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia. Getting a lawyer to help us and thousands of dollars involved. But he who has promised never to forsake us or leave us will stand by us through all the scary parts of the dish. And God will comfort us and God will give us everything we need as we deal with these scary things. But is the battle worth it? Is it all really worth it? Oh, absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Because God will use our Bible college and will grow our Bible college to train up more pastors and more missionaries and more Christian leaders who will win souls and start churches and hold to the conservative hymns and to the King James Bible. Let me say it again. Every ministry of our church is meant to bring glory to God. And every ministry will, at some point, have its piatoskilophobia. It's going to cost us blood, sweat, and tears. But is it all worth it? That's the question. Well, take our bus ministry, for example. For years now, in fact, we've got our fifth anniversary of our bus ministry coming up very soon, this month. And we've put hundreds and hundreds of man hours into the bus ministry. We've poured thousands of dollars into the bus ministry. Going and knocking on doors and uh, encouraging parents to let their children ride the bus. And we bring them to, uh, to church here and they experience super church for the ages 5 to 12. And we've had a real good number of kids ride our bus. Not all of the kids have stuck with us, but a number has. But is it worth it? All that effort, all that time, all that money, is it worth it? Well, I tell you what, you just go pay a visit to 724 and you ask for a little boy named Pablo. Pablo, who's been coming on the bus ministry for a few years. Pablo, who we'd look at and wonder, 
Are we getting through to Pablo? Last Sunday, Pablo got saved. And you ask him, was the bus ministry worth it? May, oh, wait, you wait till you get to heaven to ask Pablo if the bus ministry was worth it. And what do you think Pablo's going to say? There are a lot of Pablos out there. There are a lot of families that we can't reach any other way but through the bus ministry. Folks, we've got our church and we've got four ministries. I call them our children. We've got our bus ministry. Count them with me. Right? Our bus ministry. We've got our Bible college. We've got our soul winners ministry. And we've got one more major ministry. Do you know what that one is? Some of you said it. Missions. Missions. And we support 69 missionaries with money and with prayer every month, every month, every month. We've got a couple more missionaries coming this month. We ought to be able to take them on. Our missions giving last month was good. We almost made our, our red line. We've got the map on the back there, the chart showing it all, the different five months now we've got of evidence there. Two of our months, we kind of fell down a little bit. I don't know. That was January, February. Our, our givings were down. I don't know if people who pledged to give used the money to pay off their Christmas debts. I don't know if they did that. But it's just funny that January, February, I, so only the Lord knows, right? But this past month has been pretty good. We're just about $300 off our line. But it means, folks, like God says, that there may be meat in mine house. That way we're able to support missionaries. But well, we already support 69. Isn't that enough? Well, uh, go ask the lost souls that need a missionary, right? Maybe the 70th missionary will reach certain lost souls that will never, ever, we never even knew existed. And then the 71st missionary. And the 75th missionary. Well, isn't 75 enough? Do you think 75 people is enough to reach a world of 7.5 billion? What do you think? There's 200 countries in this world. If we had one missionary in every country, that's 200 missionaries. And one missionary for every country is not enough. Let's just keep on going till Jesus calls us home. Amen? Let's just keep growing and going and doing His will until the day the trumpet sounds and He calls us to Himself. Let's, let's just do it that way. What a battle. What a cost. Is it worth it all? Well, how did you get saved? And aren't you glad you're saved? Pretty quiet. Amen? Sure. I'm so glad that some teenager witnessed to me. Couldn't understand how he could be so crazy to believe in Jesus. But that was the first time anyone had actually witnessed to me. I thank God for the little church I went to and those little sermons I listened to and the people there that prayed for me and encouraged me. And then finally, that one man in Montreal that shared with me exactly how we got saved. On April the 6th, yesterday was my 44th spiritual birthday. Ask me if I'm glad that someone shared the gospel with me. Huh. Hey, both hands, both feet. How about that? Hallelujah, I'm, I'm happy to be saved. That's why we're doing it. We come to the scary parts of the dish. What do we do? We look to Him who's promised never to leave us nor forsake us. Let me ask you this question. Do you have any piatta phobia in your life? Is there anything that you know you should be doing but you're scared to do? Have you come to the scary parts of the dish? Now can I encourage you that the same God who stood with Joshua, who stood with Barak, who stood with Gideon, who stood with the disciples, who is here to stand with us. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And what might your scary dish be? Maybe for someone here it's their health. And your health has got a big question mark over it. And you're not sure if you're going to maintain your health or if you're going to lose your health. And maybe for you, you've got piatoskelophobia. You've come to the scary part of the dish. It's your health. Maybe for someone here today, it's their finances. Perhaps you've realized you've, you've bitten off more than you can chew. 
and the bills, I don't know how this works, but no matter where you move, the bills find you. It doesn't matter. They find you. They're like a disease. And maybe you found that you have taken on too much debt. Now what am I going to do? Or maybe your job is in the balances and they're talking about downsizing at work. And you're thinking, oh no, I've got this payment and this payment and these people that depend upon me. What's going to happen? And maybe it's your finance. Maybe that's the scary part of your dish. Possibly it's your, oh listen to this. Possibly it's your regrets over your past sins and your mistakes. Things that you've done that you just hope, hope, hope that no one in this world ever finds out things you've done. And you've gone to God and you've asked for forgiveness, but you still have these regrets and nagging, nagging feelings and doubts. And maybe that's your scary, scary part of your dish. Maybe that's your piatoskilophobia. Well, folks, listen. The only thing we can do is to go to Him who has promised never to leave us or forsake us. How would you like to be able to leave your fear on the altar today? How would you like to be able to come forward and meet with God, get on your knees and meet with God, and leave your scary parts on the altar, and then walk back to your, your seat with the Lord? Isn't, isn't that, doesn't that sound good? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. And I want to encourage you to come on this invitation.